Okay, once it loads, that just means it's a really good presentation. <laughs> Okay, so um, for my project, my capstone project, I built a Canvas course uh, titled Instructional Design for Distance Learning, so specifically for e-learning. <clears throat> How do I, sorry. Okay, so I the course is titled Student Success and Career Readiness. I will cover some of the content itself, but Truly really why I'm here is to discuss the instructional design process. Um, so the purpose of this course is to create a Canvas course um, focusing on inclusivity and accessibility, um, specifically in distance education. Um, the development process was informed using these four principles here. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce them and then I'll give you examples throughout the presentation. So one, I kind of call him the grandfather of the rest because you could kind of include all of the rest into number one, but it's UDL principles. UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. Um, and it was created in the 90s to help instructors um, sorry, I'm nervous, to help instructors uh, have tools for accessibility and ex inclusivity, as well as just address any barriers within their curriculum. So it's been around for a while and you could lump so many things within UDL, so it's a very useful tool. LVLC, so that stands for a labor-based learning contract. Um, from here on out, I'll just say learning contract so I don't get tongue-tied. Um, it's the non-conventional method of grading. So it's not letter grades. Um, it's typically at the beginning of your Canvas course right off the bat. It gives students accountability. Like I said, we'll get into it a little further. Critical reflection, one of my favorites, reflection. There's a whole lot of research behind the importance of reflection. Um, the main point I want to take away from that is um, students just connecting what they're learning in the course content to spirit experience that they've had in their past. Um, and there's research that suggests um, that that registers into their long-term memory and e-learning engagement, very important. And then variation of assessment and feedback. Variation is vital to online learning and the design process, variation everywhere. Assessment, feedback, how students submit their assignments, um, you'll see it sprinkled all throughout. Oops. Okay, so these are the three type of assessments or assignments that I built and also the importance of the rich content editor. Um, so self-reflective summaries, I explained why reflective uh, learning is important. Uh, discussion board, I'll talk about that. And then also, so there's five modules each being about three hours long. So it's a total of 15 hours of content. Um, the only module that stands out a bit is module four, and that's when we build a resume and a cover letter. Um, the others are pretty similar. <clears throat> okay, the importance of a rich content editor. So you need to use this, in my opinion, that sounds kind of bossy. In my opinion, <laughs> everybody should be using this. Um, when they build their assignments. Uh, this is something that I actually learned amongst so many other things while I was attending my program. Um, so in my experience when I built, I would just bold and increase the font size. Um, so you could see in the box, it says heading three. If that just says paragraph and you bold and um, increase font size, uh, let's say you have a student who is blind that's using Read Speaker. Um, their read speaker, if you use the heading, it will go through the heading. So it doesn't start at the very top and go all the way down to the bottom. So it's just really, again, inclusive. Um, and it's an easy way to just mark that off your list. I always think about like, because they are one-off circumstances, but those are always the ones that get you, right? Is like when you have a student come in and your student's blind and now you have to change your entire curriculum. Okay, so here's the theoretical framework in action. So here's an example assignment. Um, it demonstrates UDL, again, universal design of uh, universal design for learning, and it kind of explains itself. It, uh, it's just a template of how we can make uh, online learning 
uh, accessible and scalable, most importantly. So it also demonstrates critical reflection as well as variation. So it is a reflection summary. There's a prompt involved. There's one of these assignments in every single module besides module four and the prompt reflective. And then something I find to be really important is the variation of uh, the students to be able to choose how they want to create their assignments. So this is the only accessibility for disabilities. And I wish that we would stop thinking about it that way. When you think about accessibility, a lot of people think automatically like disability and how we could um, accommodate them. Yes, but also we want to accommodate people with just different interests and like preference and, and it's not just disability. So some people are really excited about writing. <laughs> and as I talk and I may screw up a bit, I'm far better at writing than I am speaking. <laughs> and so if this were me, I would definitely um, take a video of my verbal response. So that's just like an example of why it's so helpful. Next slide. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is the learning contract. So this is just a screenshot and I'll go to Canvas after this. Um, uh, you could argue that it has variation. So it lays out very clearly to the students right off the bat. Um, this is what is expected from you. It um, it gives them, it, it empowers them and empowering the student and giving them um, choice and accountability over their learning. Uh, I've seen just, they'll, they'll take off with it and they, the, they care a lot more about what they're learning instead of somebody acting like they know everything speaking to them, right? So this is a way to just like keep them accountable. Also, I have this thought, um, can this be negotiable? I feel like it could, why couldn't it? If there was something that they were like, hey, I think I would learn better if this was tweaked a bit, I have no problem being like, okay, so let's switch it up and then you'll click the box and it quite literally is a contract. Um, all of this is long and it's 30, 15 hours of curriculum, so I can't get through all of it, but I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. So <laughs> I showed this to my friend, she was like, nice screenshot of your face. I was like, that's not the point. Um, so accessibility, so TXT files for accurate closed captioning. Again, it's kind of like um, using the rich content editor. I feel like it should just be used across the board, closed captioning. Um, it's easy. TXT files, however, not as easy. I did do it. Um, it was very time consuming, but it did make my captioning very accurate. This is the uh, a screenshot of the process for my introduction video. Um, Auto-generated uh, captions are completely fine. Not as accurate, but something is better than nothing. Okay, and then I'm going to segue into more variation, but this time into variation of the course content itself. So Michael Moore, <clears throat> uh, not the super famous one, Michael G. Moore, I should say. <laughs> so he says, the main weakness of many distance education programs is our commitment to only one type of medium. I've experienced this myself. We've all seen it before. We're all working in education. So what I did was diversify the course content itself. At the beginning of each module, there is a module overview, again, except for module four. Um, and it includes videos, readings, uh, and self-assessment tools. I bring in an element of choice, which again, I feel is important for student empowerment um, and uh, engagement. And so they only choose three of the mediums and then they use those for their discussion assignment and their self-reflective assignment, which is at the end of the module. Um, and then I have this really, I wanna try this, but it, obviously this is all theory, but as an educator, um, I know we all have had experiences with discussion boards and have had students complain about discussion boards and how they're kind of monotonous. And I was thinking, I was like, wait, so if we have a whole list of content and each student is picking three, that means that when they talk about it in their discussion, more than likely they will be talking about something that another student didn't read about. So that student has an easier time responding and I just feel like it would make it more engaging. Um, and also, like I said, the element of choice is helpful. Okay, further, I, I 
could not do this without shouting out Paulo Freire. I love him so much. Also known as the, fa the father of critical pedagogy. Um, he talks about the banking method of learning, which is, or teaching, which is basically, I know everything and you don't, and I'm here to shuffle information into you and expect you to memorize it. And he argues that it's not efficient. I totally follow that framework. Um, <clears throat> it lacks connection. It lacks humility and just like um, human to human connection, I believe is what leads to true learning. Um, so I have great inspiration from him during my design process. Um, I've already mentioned the power of choice. <clears throat> oh, also teacher vulnerability. So I feel like that's a good way to connect with students, which is the antithesis of the banking method, um, which is why I mentioned that. Um, Power of choice, I feel like it's self-explanatory and I've mentioned it several times. Revolution, what a strong word. And I was like, I feel like I could say it though. So there's so much research um, with e-learning and instructional design within e-learning and really well-informed research. Like all of the stuff that I'm saying is all research that exists. It's not properly implemented, however. And it needs to be revolutionized. And I truly feel that distance education as we know it will and should be revolutionized. Smiley face, I'm pretty determined to make it happen. This stuff makes me really excited. A, learning makes me excited as a whole. B, getting students engaged makes me excited. C, getting students engaged in a learning or in an e-learning environment, that's just like makes even bigger of a challenge and I love a good challenge. And I think that we could do it. There's no reason why we shouldn't. Okay, I know this slide looks busy, but this kind of just shows you um, the overlap between all of it and how the ultimate goal here is accessibility and inclusivity. And you could, I could have put seven other points, you know, that fit into that goal. Um, but for the sake of writing, I didn't want to, do too much research because I didn't want a 40 page paper. <laughs> Here are my references. Oh, I forgot to take out. So I just wanted to address like how I'll represent this project in my future um, and how this training uh, is incredibly valuable to my long term goals. Um, I started teaching at 21. I'm now 27. I had zero Canvas experience and zero training. I had training from like my higher ups and, but a lot of it was self-taught. And I'm really thankful that I had that self-teaching experience because that just shows that it's interest-based. It's something I'm passionate about. I wouldn't go in and fiddle with it if I didn't want to, right? And then, so having that six years of experience and then being able to come here and hear from professionals um, that have years of training and like online instructional design is, com it's like, it's you can't put a price on it and i'm so grateful and i'm so excited um and also i like i said i truly feel like we could revolutionize uh the e-learning distance learning experience and make it engaging and right now it's not where it needs to be and so long-term goals i i feel like i could totally fit in that field and i would love to fit into that field and find a job where i could uh, design content in a way that makes students engaged and fulfilled. Okay. So was that a lot out? What, where am that I? That was great, Anna. That was fantastic. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. Um, as someone who teaches primarily online and is working on, you know, making changes to some of my courses right now, I got some really good ideas from this. So that was fantastic just from that angle. Awesome. Um, actually that kind of feeds into my question too. So, one of the things that I'm a firm believer in is as a teacher, your courses are never really completely complete, right? There's always something that works well, but there's things that don't work well during the semester as well when you're teaching. So looking back at what you have right now, if you were, say, to teach this, with what you have right now, what would you change, do you think, after having compiled this already? What, what, what do you think needs to change this from what you have here? So... Oh man, that's such a good question. It's really good. It's, I, I don't mean to say this isn't. This is fantastic. No, I, and I We're understand. Always trying to grow, right? So absolutely. Um, so I'd really 
I am skeptical about the three hours per module. And right. the thing is, is like, you don't really know until you push students through that course and to, uh, if you need to add or subtract. Um, so actually I mentioned module four um, that it's a little different from the other modules. And that's because we're building cover letters and resumes and it's a little more um, technical. And I didn't want to, could it benefit from, uh, could students benefit in that module from a reflective assignment and a discussion assignment? Absolutely. Um, and I would love to add it, but I just didn't because I thought what I had was really extensive. So that's one thing I would change. If I thought harder, I'd come up with more stuff. But um, I, I honestly, I just want to put it into practice. Like, I'm like, I want to see it. that whole discussion board thing, like to get students to read you know, different things from other peers and then have them talk about it and teach each other. Teaching is learning. Like if you could teach something to your peers, that is like phenomenal. So long-winded answer, but. <laughs> well, no, it, it's true. You never really know how much you've learned something until you can teach it. And then you find out very quickly whether you can actually <laughs> do it or not. So that's fantastic. I always say teachers are just like glorified students. <laughs> There's truth to that. Um, so I don't know, this is the course itself and I don't know, or actually I'll just sit and if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to answer. Not surprisingly, we do. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was one of the better research. It was better informed by your research than, than many that I've seen for a while. So you're to be commended for that. I also found some ideas that I'm going to steal wholeheartedly, um, and maybe some things that I want to talk about uh, as we're redoing our core courses, we I, we are trying to get students thinking long term about their projects. And, and there might be some potential in your idea of a learning contract, um, especially since I think interdisciplinarity, our approach is a little less like a bank approach. You know, I mean, um, there's a map in my office that has, it's one of those medieval maps that's got the unfinished part where it's like, here, there be dragons, because they didn't know what was there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what we try to do is we ask students to explore a little bit. If if there was a, if the discipline had an answer for it already, we wouldn't be, ne we wouldn't be needed, right? Um, I'm kind of curious for my own interests about your resume cover letter assignment. So having taught writing for many years, especially to underprepared students, I use a resume cover letter as a diagnostic tool. Because you can learn a lot about if a student can write with an audience in mind, if if she can write with um, precision and use grammar, and if they can follow instructions. But I've also got this idea that it's a learning tool to help people learn about the culture of a discipline. So, you know, if you do it in a math class where we don't usually think about those things, it helps them understand not only the values of a culture, but also how math people talk to one another. So right. I'm wondering if you just elaborate a little bit more about how mm -hmm. the interdisciplinary approach, I mean, why a resume cover letter assignment here? I mean, they're very practical. I think they're great, but why? What If you'd elaborate just a little bit more as to why you chose that particular assignment and what you do with it. So my target audience here is like, I was it's my own students. Um, obviously I'm, I'm not a teacher anymore. I was faculty. I just moved out of that. Um, it's a trade college. There's very technical language. Um, so you made a good point about like, how, how do you speak in math? It's like, how do you speak in automation? How do you speak in welding? How do you X, Y, Z? Let me just right, go. I to think the term is actually disciplinary dialogue. If I remember yeah. right, that sounds, that sounds right. But it please, sounds I haven't heard it, but it does sound right. I'm like, yes, it's right. Um, so the assignment itself, I also use it as a diagnostic tool. I, I, so I work as a job placement specialist here and I have students come to me and they're like, I need help with resumes. And before I sit down with them, I'm like, please take this and let it guide you. And, um, and then come back and we'll go from there. So I am wholeheartedly against templates like Word, uh, Google Drive, all that. They don't age well. They're not editable. They're not original. Bad, bad, bad. I always tell people that. Um, and ironically, I'm like, I know I'm telling you that this is a template, but it's one that I built from scratch. Right. And then I have like 
just this, these annotated comments. So that's what I use as just like the building process. Like I want them to take it upon themselves to use this to guide them through the process. And then um, if you go next, it's like a draft and then I give them personalized feedback, which I actually was gonna include um, variation of feedback, but I was scared that I was going to go over time. I could talk about this forever if I'm being completely honest. Fun that you're excited about it. Yeah, I just, I love it. Um, so this is, so they have to submit the, their first draft. I don't know why my computer is being so slow. Um, and then the next process is just similar, but with uh, the cover letter. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I was, I was, I'm interested a little less in process. I mean, this all looks very familiar. Um, okay. as as the way co resume cover letters are taught, but I, I was interested in, in why, I mean, why that particular thing. And I think, I think you answered it very well um, in that it, it, it has that function of helping students do some thinking. It's right? also some exploring. Right. And um, I can make the, the point that, so the class is called student success and career readiness. Student success and career success are so similar. And I feel like they should go hand in hand because you're building your future. Like you're building right. your career. That's why you're in education. Like you're building your passion. It's like, it's like a success campaign for yourself. And so the combination of the two um, topics I'm really passionate about. And that's why I did the combination. And that's why I use the resume and the cover letter. Perfect. Thank you. Well answered. Wonderful. You know, we'd love to hear your thoughts or questions as well. Yeah, awesome. No, I I'm, I come from more of a practitioner side to this uh, this discussion than the theoretical or academic side of things. Um, I appreciate your discussion about accessibility because um, in my world, we really think about it in terms of ADA compliance um, and whether content is accessible. Um, but you kind of approach it from like a Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences approach where you're looking at different strengths that people have and how they approach different content in a different way and how they can leverage those strengths in different assignments. So I think I, I appreciated the variation that you talked about in your presentation. I think that's an important element of any, of any instructional design. At the same time, I also think it's important that there's some degree of predictability um, for online students, that there's some pattern recognition that they can kind of get into a rhythm throughout the course, uh, the context of a course so they can know expectations. And something I, I noticed, um, that maybe could be improved upon is the use of rubrics. Um, I, I didn't know. I didn't really see like very spelled out rubrics or um, detailed criteria specifying like how how certain assignments or things would be graded. I know there's there's some functionality for that uh, procedurally in Canvas to add, but that's something that could um, even enhance some of these this contractual notion of having having a contract. In that, if you refer to the the rubrics really well and that they're well articulated, it kind of does a lot of the work for you as an educator and preventing some of that uh, back and forth communication. Um, that's more about grades than about content, and I think that's what educators want to want to be. They want to be educators talking about ideas and things, not talking about the minutia of and procedural technicalities about how assignments were graded. Um, so I think to the extent that you can do that stuff up front, um, and I, I like your your conversation of contracts is an excellent discussion. Um, but the extent you can do that up front can alleviate some of the downstream burden of having to resolve those issues. Um, I also appreciate the theoretical uh, discussion about Paulo Paulo Freire. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I, I wasn't familiar with critical critical pedagogy. Um, but no, it gave me a little something to explore after this. Uh, conversation as well. Yeah. And so I just want to address a couple of things that you said. So I did think about rubrics and I kind of was like, okay, hey, I'm moving away from conventional. And that's where the learning contract came in and flexibility and inclusivity and things of that nature. Um, clarity and, um, pattern, like you said, especially in e-learning is very important. And that is a con concern that I had. Um, like, is this too elusive? And because it's so unconventional that they're going to be like, what the heck am I looking at? And purposely, I so I say that one, two, three, and five modules are formatted in 
the way that I described. Um, for module four, I wanted to bring in some of that conventional conventionality, <laughs> uh, just being that instead of a module overview, it's actually like, we're going to schedule a lecture and you're going to take notes and you're going to submit assignments for feed, like something that's very much more familiar to them. And that's why I put that in there because I do want, I don't want to scare them. I don't want to scare them off. Um, I also, it's very important because the idea of uh, learning contracts is not used. And uh, let me go to modules. Before the learning contract, I have like a, I have a two minute video that explains it. I'm welcome. And Neil, you actually have access to this. So you can. I have pulled up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's important for the instructor to address it, right? To even address um, that. I, I tell them, I'm like, hey, when I first learned about this, it was hard for me to wrap my mind around. So don't let this intimidate you. Like this is meant to help you. Um, and it is very much experimental. And, and that's where I say like the implementation is lacking. And like we must, we have to give it a shot because how else are we going to know? And that's kind of where I'm sitting with it. And um, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> I think that's great. I, I, I appreciate how you've structured the, the course, um, and especially kind of adding some additional accessibility, uh, captioning and stuff. That's, that does take time. Um, and yeah, no, I'm just curious, like when you're looking at a interdisciplinary, cause I'm not in this program and I'm not instructing this program, but I'm curious, um, are, are, are students self-selecting into the types of assignments that they will complete instead of having a, a canned, everyone does the, the front cover page assignment and then everybody moves to a uh, three to six uh, slideshow presentation. Does everybody go through all of those or are they self-selecting into each of those assignment types? they choose what assignment type they want to submit. And, and, but there are parameters, right? If it's a slideshow, you give me three to six slides. If it's a video, at least two minutes. If it's a paper, 500 words. So like there is still some structure, but they're choosing how they want to submit it. Um, All of those options can tell me what I need to know. Like that can, it shows a reflection of their learning, which as an instructor is what I need to see. And that's all because of that, I'm like, yes, let's give them choice. And like, em like I said, empowering a student is like, that's what we should be doing is like giving them control of their learning and, but also being guidance. It's not, you don't want to make yourself a peer because you still have to be a mentor and a guide. But like, again, I, I could take it back to like the banking method at Harvard, uh, the, the national economist comes in and has an hour lecture um, in a stadium and then he walks out and never sees the students again. And I'm like, where is that learning, you know, to, it, and that's a discussion to be had in my opinion, like human learning started with human to human connection. And I feel like that's where we're getting lost in e-learning is that it's not human to human connection. And so like, how do we create that? And yeah, I, I, it hasn't happened. It's not happening. I mean, it is because like here I am talking about it and I've done a bunch of research on it. But like I said, the implementation isn't. Also, I got a 10 minute yeah. warning because I don't have. And I'm actually we're going to have to I'm going to have to go really soon anyways. I have another conference okay. starting right now. But Sorry, but I wouldn't no, know that. that's not your fault. You didn't know that. And you're great. This is a fantastic discussion. I'd rather go a little bit long than come up short. What this shows is that people are engaged and it's wonderful. Um I'm gonna have to bow out, but I wanted to say you did a fantastic job and you should go celebrate tonight. You did a, a great job on this. It's been a joy working with you. I'm so excited. Thanks, Spencer. You've been awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, maybe we should just wrap it up. I mean, I, it is exciting that there's so much to talk about. Um, well done. It was, uh, as I said, it was impressive. So um, thank you, uh, Neil, for coming. Um, and uh, you should be proud of yourself. It was a nice presentation. So. Congratulations, and we'll uh, hopefully see you around. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Have a nice right. day. Thanks, Neil. See ya. <laughs>